Hey, it's Pastor Oliver here, and I pray and trust that you've had an outstanding day, an incredible day, that um, you've had a day that has really been purposeful, that you've lived life uh, with a sense of purpose. And so I'm excited that you would take time out of your day for this opportunity to uh, share in the Word of God. And so, of course, many of you know that we're now uh, having to do an online type of experience as it relates to our worship service and even as it relates to our Bible study. And it's amazing, again, at the top of the year, we declared, uh, do something new. And so here it is, we're doing something new, and I'm excited that you're doing something new with us. And so I um, wanna encourage you to go ahead and get a Bible, and of course, make sure that you have some sort of uh, instrument to take notes, uh, as I'm gonna share with you some various uh, verses and some principles uh, that I really believe is going to have a significant impact upon your life. And so before we start this study, let's uh, ask God to prepare our hearts uh, for this time of sharing. So Father, we thank you again for the privilege that is ours to call upon your name. And even as we open your word, do open our hearts that we might receive, believe, and obey. Thank you for every single person that is join, joining us today uh, in this online Bible study experience. And I thank you for how technology can even assist us in our experience of theology. And so meet us in this moment is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, of course, if you're a member of EBC, you know that uh, we're in this exciting uh, church-wide study. It is, in, it is entitled uh, More. We recognize that God has, through God through Christ, has come to give us life and not just to give us life, but he's given us life and we're to live that life more. That's the key term, more abundantly. And as we live this life that is more abundantly, we do so with a sense of focus. There's three things that we are focused on that in order to have this more experience, you and I must be clear as it relates to three things. Here they are, be, which deals with our identity. Second of all, do, which deals with our purpose or better yet, our mission. And then of course, go as it deals with our mission field, the particular context wherein we're to live out our calling. Today, I wanna to deal with that second aspect, this aspect of do. And of course, uh, we are individuals that have been wired with a purpose we have been wired with a mission we have been wired with a kingdom assignment we see it modeled in the life of christ of how he came to of course to fulfill uh, the work and the will of the father and we as well have been called to fulfill a particular work we've been called to do a particular assignment we've been anointed if you were to do a particular assignment and so a sense of fulfillment and contentment will only come into your life uh, when you're living again on purpose and you're flowing within the purpose that God has given you. And so in this study, there's one key foundational verse that deals with this aspect of our mission. It comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter number two, uh, verse number 10. And here's what the text says. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Here's the key term for good works, for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we shall walk in them. Notice again that Paul in this particular passage of scripture is emphatically clear uh, that God through Christ Jesus has created us, has designed us, has made us as we'll see a divine masterpiece. And he's made us as a divine masterpiece for a particular good work that he has assigned to each and every individual that is a part of his kingdom. And so we want to talk about this whole aspect as it relates to uh, the good work, uh, as it relates to this do aspect. And so the first thing that I want you to notice is the divine uh, artist. And the divine artist is God himself through Christ Jesus. Again, notice what the text says, for we are, here it is, his workmanship. And so whenever you speak of a workmanship or that particular personal pronoun, his, it denotes the reality that God is the divine artist, that God has a plan for us, that God, of course, has a mission for us, that he is the divine artist. Now, what is really interesting is that an artist always utilizes material. When you consider a painting, an artist will utilize different paints. When you consider, if you would, uh, some sort of pottery, uh, that pottery is made out of some type of, um, of clay, when you consider uh, even some metal uh, piece of art. Uh, it is always some particular material that God utilizes. And so when we consider the divine artist, notice, if you would, the, the target of his work. Uh, the target, in other words, what is it that God utilized? You know, what, what was the target 
as it relates to uh, the instrument or better yet the material or better yet the resource uh, that God had at his disposal for this masterpiece that he created. Now here's the unfortunate part. He's the divine artist, but quite candidly, the material or better yet the raw material that he utilized uh, was all of a, a defected quality. There was nothing perfect. There was nothing pristine. Uh, there was nothing outstanding about the uh, material that God had uh, to utilize. And here is the interesting part. When we talk about the workmanship and when we talk about the material or the target of his work, that denotes you and I, that God, of course, targeted us. He focused upon us uh, to become his masterpiece. Now, when you look at Ephesians chapter number or two, verse one down to verse number three, it is very descriptive as it relates to the condition, as it relates to uh, the quality of the material that God had targeted for this great work. Notice what the text says. And you have he quickened. Here's one of the descriptors uh, who were dead in trespasses and sin. Underscore that. Wherein in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedient, among whom also we have had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of the flesh, 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 excuse me, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and as well as the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And so when we look at this particular passage of scripture, Ephesians uh, 2, verse 1 down to verse number 3, Notice again the descriptors as it relates to the people or the raw state uh, that this divine artist used in order to create, in order to craft the masterpiece. The Bible says at least four things about us, and we were the targets, if you would, of his work. We were dead. In other words, we were dead in trespasses and in sins. We had no pulse. There was no spiritual uh, responsiveness, if you would, towards God from us, or towards us to God, better yet. We were dead, we were dead. Uh, of course, God, of course, who is life, is the one uh, who has quickened us through the Spirit and through His Son. But the initial state and condition that we were in, we were dead, again, in trespasses and in sins. Not only were we dead in trespasses and sins, but the text also says, where in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now, here's the key term, that worketh in the children of disobedience. In other words, we were not just dead, but here's the second thing. We were defiant and even disobedient. As opposed to us obeying God and honoring God, the sinful propensity within the human heart is to disobey God. It is to be defiant towards God. Think about that for a moment. You know, Paul, better yet, not Paul, but better yet, it was David who said that you and I were born into iniquity and we were shaped by iniquity. And so when we came into this world uh, in the lyrics of one rap singer, uh, we were naughty by nature. You know, in other words, we came here defiant. We came here disobedient. And so Paul also goes and gives a third statement. He says that we were also in times past controlled by the lusts of our flesh fulfilling the desires thereof and even of the mind, which denotes that we were dominated. We were controlled by our flesh. In other words, that part of us that has not been redeemed. But here's the, the fourth part. He says, and we were by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. We were dead, defiant and disobedient, dominated, if you would, by our minds and even by our sinful impulses, but we were also damnable. In other words, we were children of wrath. Now pay close attention, that's the target of God's work. That when you consider the raw material, when you consider the resources, when you consider the individuals or who we were prior to Christ, prior to being saved, we were dead, defiant, disobedient, dominated, and even beyond that, we were damnable. And so that's the target of his work. But let's look at, second of all, the types of work. And so the Bible says that we are his workmanship, his workmanship. God is, through Christ, is a divine artist, and that's the target, you and I. But here's the types of work that he has performed 
or he has executed within us, it's tridimensional. In other words, it's a threefold type of work. Some can argue it's twofold, but I want to uh, submit and suggest to you it's a threefold type of work. Here it is, his work for us. Second of all, his work in us. And third of all, his work through us. Let me break it down. His work for us, that is salvation. That the reason why Christ came, suffered, bled, and died, died in our stead for our sins so that you and I be can become the righteous recipients of salvation, he died, here it is, so that you and I might have salvation in and through him by faith. Again, Jesus says in John 10 and 10 that I've come that you might have life. That phrase life goes against the first description, uh, description that we talked about, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But as a result of us accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior, the Bible says he has quickened us. That word quickened simply means that he has made us alive. He has spiritually resurrected us. He has given us new life. And so that is to work for us, for us, in other words, salvation. Again, the Bible makes mention in 2 Corinthians, I believe it is 5 and verse 21, that he who knew no sin at all became sin for us, that we might become the righteous of God through him. He did it for us, just for me, just for you. He died. That's to work for us, and that is salvation. But here's the second part, the work in us. The work in us is sanctification. And so he is working in us. To work in us simply denotes that he is changing us. He is transforming us. He is making us new on the inside, which again deals with the impulses of the flesh and even beyond that of our minds. He is changing us from the inside out because genuine, authentic change and transformation is, now, is not from the outside in, but rather it is from the inside out. In other words, the outside in, that is actually called behavior modification. I mean, you can change your behavior and you can change the exterior way in which you conduct yourself. But real lasting change requires a change on the inside where he begins to change the desires of our flesh, where he begins to change our minds, our mindsets. Because again, what we believe dictates how we behave and the consistency of how we behave ultimately determines who and what we become. And so if I want to change what I've become, I got to change how I behave, but I can only change how I behave when I change what I believe. And so changing what I believe denotes an inside internal type of work. And so again, his work for us, salvation, his work in us, sanctification, but his work through us is service. In other words, genuine kingdom service happens when we allow Christ to fill us on the inside, and it is through the fullness of Christ in us that he flows through us. We begin to serve. We really then become, if you will, the body of Christ. Catch that phrase, the body of Christ. Of course, we're still here on earth, and we're the body of Christ. So here is the real argument. The church is not shut down. No, we got to stop with that particular phrase, and quite candidly, I've been wrong in even utilizing that particular phrase, because here's the problem with it. The building is closed, but the body is still functioning. Did you catch that? The building, the physical place where we gather, that's the building, that's not the church. But the people who gather in the building is the body. And though the building doors may be closed, the body is still out and abroad. And so even right now, wherever you're located, you're the body of Christ. And the fullness of Christ is within us. And as his fullness is within us, he flows through us. So then I become the hands of Christ. You become the hands of Christ. Our feet, of course, we began to walk for Christ. We began to go in those different places that he would have us to go so that we might serve as an ambassador, so that we might serve as a representative, so that we might serve as, here it is, change agents, the eyes of Christ. He, we, we, we see as Christ saw. We see people, of course, and we, re, and we see them with eyes of compassion. And so again, notice the tridimensional work, the work for us, salvation, Jesus did something for us that you and I could not do for ourselves. He came, suffered, bled, and died in our stead for our sins that we might become the righteousness of Christ. Second of all, his work in us, that's sanctification. He is 
changing us on the inside, that it might show up on the outside. And here is what Paul says in Philippians 1, that he who has begun a good work, here it is, in you, in you, in you, shall perform it until the day of redemption. His work for us, salvation, his work in us, sanctification, his work through us is service. Now, quite candidly, I want to give you this last point and then we'll conclude our time together. Not just, again, the target of his work, us who were dead, defiant, dominated, and damnable. The types of his work, his work for us, salvation, his work in us, sanctification, his work through us, service. But then here's the last aspect, the tools by which he worked. What are the spiritual tools that God through Christ used to to work on us, to make this masterpiece, as Paul defines it. And so every artist, of course, has his or her set of tools. And so there are some tools that I want to submit and suggest to you, and this is not an exhausted list. This is not a comprehensive list, but here are some key tools, of course, that uh, we see that are in the hands of the divine artist, whereby he fashions us and he forms us that we might become a masterpiece to his glory. The first one is, the scriptures, the Bible, the word of God itself is one of the spiritual tools that is used to make us into masterpieces. Here's what the text says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 down to verse 17. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Here it is. Pay close attention that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto, there's our phrase, all good works. The word of God, of course, again, does several things. It's profitable for doctrine to teach us. It is profitable for reproof. In other words, to rebuke us and to correct us. It is profitable for just that correction to change the course of our direction. It is profitable for insight, for wisdom, for instruction in righteousness so that we can be perfect. In other words, in the Greek, so that we can be mature. And as a result of such, we are now equipped. We are now furnished, says Paul, unto all good works. And so the good works that I'm able to do is because of God's word. Do you see the connection? His word prepares me, equips me so that I can do his works, good works. Here's the second thing that he also utilizes, not just again, uh, the scriptures are the word of God. But second of all, he also utilizes the spirit, the Holy Spirit. Now, listen, there's a whole lot that I can share and teach about the Holy Spirit. But one of the ministries, if you would, of the person of the Holy Spirit uh, is that the person of the Holy Spirit has come in order to change us, to make us, if you would, a spiritual masterpiece to the honor of the divine artist. And here's what the text says in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Here's the key phrase. Are changed into the same image from glory to glory, progressively from glory to glory, even as the spirit of the Lord. It is the spirit of the Lord that changes us, transforms us so that we can begin to reflect even the more the glory of the Lord. And it happens progressively. The spirit of God is sanctifying us, working on us so that we can become that masterpiece that the master takes pleasure in. It's a spirit. So the Holy Spirit has come to do much more than just make us shout and run and cry. You've heard, of course, that expression when a person has a demonstrative type of response in the worship experience. We'll say, oh, he or she caught the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Ghost has come to do much more than just calls us to have a demonstrative type of response to speak in tongues. And I'm not even debating that, but rather I want you to really understand again that the Holy Spirit has come to make you a masterpiece, to change you on the inside, that it might show up on the outside. So the first tool that he utilizes is the word of God. That's why it's so important that you read the Bible. That's why it's so important that you do as you're doing right now, participate in this time of study. But then he also utilizes not just the scriptures, but he also used the spirit the Holy Spirit has come, the, third, uh, the second person of the Holy Spirit of the Trinity, uh, God the Father, God the Son, third, and uh, God the Holy Spirit, excuse me, has come in order to change us on the inside. But here's the third one, and this is going to sound a tad bit um, paradoxical. 
Uh, you're going to perhaps say now, uh, Pastor, are you, are you for real? Is this one of the tools that he utilizes? And hear me even right now, he utilizes the tool of suffering. I know you don't like it. I don't like it. But it's a tool that he utilizes in order to equip us, in order to help us to grow and to mature. Let me prove it to you. It is there in Romans chapter five. And here's our last verse for tonight. Romans five or for today, excuse me, Romans five, verse one down to verse number five. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, the Lord, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Pay close attention now and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we also glory in tribulations. That's paradoxical, isn't it? We glory in tribulations. Also knowing that tribulations worketh patience. Patience worketh experience. Experience worketh hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, but the love of God is spread abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. Did you catch that? That the suffering that you and I endure in and through life has a divine and redemptive purpose. God recycles your pains. He doesn't take your pains and put it in a trash can. He places it in the recycle bin because he's going to take all of the misery and utilize that to develop you for your ministry. Did you get that? Yes, that suffering moment that you experience and season that you experience in your life, that time of loneliness and that time of pain and agony. God says, I'm so much God that I can take that moment of suffering, some which were self-imposed, some which was sovereignly sent, but yet and still he can utilize it. Here it is so that we can mature, so that we can grow. So then tribulation worketh patience. Patience worketh experience. That word patience means endurance. There's some things right now that you've been able to survive and to endure because here it is, you've gone through a season of suffering. It wasn't comfortable when you went through it. It wasn't uh, peaceful or pleasurable when you went through it, but it was profitable. You have a greater endurance now. That endurance has now given you experience. You have a story. You have time with God and experience with God and a testimony about God and what God is able to do and what God has done in your life. You have experience and that experience now has given you hope. You, you live now with a sense of optimism that when, when the devil had the chance to take you out, he should have taken you out then, but you've been through too much. You've endured too much. You've survived too much and you have hope. Now you have this sense of, optimism. And all of that has come as a result of your suffering. I've been there. You've been there. And here's the reality. As sure as you and I live, there will be seasons of suffering, but God has a redemptive purpose. Now come next week, I'm going to talk about the, the trophy, the trophy, the masterpiece. What is it that this divine artist is after? You know, we've talked about the target of his work, you and I. We've talked about the tools that he utilizes to work. We've talked about the spirit of God, the scriptures, and as well as suffering. And then next week when we get together, we're going to talk about the trophy of his work. Matter of fact, if you just have three minutes, I can give that to you right now. Let me talk about the trophy. I can't, I can't leave you without this here. He is really up to making a masterpiece. And the masterpiece is you and I. We're the trophy. Think about that. The God of this universe, after having made this earth and this world and the terrestrial sphere that we inhabit, earth and the cosmological world that we see and which we quite candidly cannot see in that there's so many galaxies and we're just a part of one. He says, out of all of that, my masterpiece is you. It's me. He says, that's the trophy. He said, I've, I've gone through all of this. I've given my son with one pursuit in mind to have a trophy. In other words, the whole goal, the whole purpose 
of God, who is the divine artist through his son and through his spirit, is to create a trophy, and not just a trophy, but here's the shouting part, <laughs> a trophy that he can place his name on. You know the value of a real masterpiece? The value is determined by the artist who made it. I promise you, you know, I can somewhat draw. It's not anything exceptional, uh, but my drawings and my paintings and things that I can do, you know, I've gone to some of those, you know, facilities where you have, you know, paint for a night and uh, you have, you, um, I was going to say wine, but you, yeah, you have wine, you know, and you go and you paint or what have you. And um, none of the paintings that I've ever painted or even others have painted would ever stand and be placed in a gallery. No one would come and watch them or look at them or view them. But I've had the privilege of going to Amsterdam and I've gone to actually the museum where you have Rembrandt. Yes, Rembrandt, the fine original work of a Rembrandt. Van Gogh, I mean, we can go all day. Michelangelo of the Renaissance era. And here is the amazing part. The value of the art that they've created is because there's signatures on it and it actually came from the hand of an amazing artist. God says this, you're my masterpiece. Greater than any work of art by Michelangelo, greater than any art by Rembrandt, Van Gogh. He says, no, 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 no. The work and the masterpieces that they've created, it's amazing. And oftentimes when you go and you see the masterpieces that have been made by men, it is placed behind a protective glass, don't touch it. But no, the masterpiece that God has made, he has placed his signature on us. And that is what gives us value. And he says, listen, I wanna use you in service. You have been made as a masterpiece so that the master can use you. And so come again next week and let's dive a tad bit more in Ephesians chapter two, verse number 10. Now, isn't that amazing? We're still in Ephesians two, just one verse, verse number 10. And we've only dealt with one point. We just talked we just talked about the divine artist next week. Let me see what we're going to talk about. Let me see. I'm already excited about our time next week. We're going to talk about the distinctive art. And then we're going to conclude and deal with this last observation where this art has been placed, the designated arena of this art. So stay tuned. Come and be a part of our time of study. Again, I thank you so much for sharing with us, and I hope that something has been said to encourage you and has been said to bless you. Here's the last thing I want to ask you to do. This weekend, we're going to have our online worship experience that will take place at, uh, at 7, 15, 9, 30, and 12 o'clock. So go to elizabethbaptist.org, sign up, and sign on and be a part of this uh, amazing worship experience. Thank you so much. Love you. Take care. God bless.